What's the buzz? Busy bee. You make us sweet for you and me. I plant the flowers. You bring the queen. We'll build a great big colony. Spring is fun. Let's fly sky high. We're alive at the hive. Hi. Hey. Hey guys, welcome back to Alive at the Hive. We've got a real special show for you today. Uh, it includes honey extraction. Uh, I think the date's the 14th? I think today's the 14th. Yeah. Flag day. 14th, for us 14th of June. So uh, for some of us, we're still extracting uh, spring honey. Show us, show us George, what's your spring this honey is a great, like? This great example of some spring honey right here. Nice and, nice and light colored. Yeah, Here's so a... on the table I also brought some of mine. So that's just little eight ounce containers to show you the difference of extraction through the year. The two ones in the center, they're actually only a week apart between two different apiary yards. Uh, you might not see it in the camera, but there's a slight amber difference. And then the darker one right on the end here is what we extract in September, October. I think this is the, the, the best reason why you should support your local beekeepers is because you get honey that looks like this and you get honey that looks like this. You know, if you go to the store, all the honey looks the same color, but we know that, you know, if you get local honey and you get it right off the hive, it's gonna look gonna look like this. So be exciting to see what our honey looks like today. Yeah, just just a fun fact. Turn your bottle back upside down, George. This one? Yeah. That little bubble? See the bubble. See how slow it takes to get to the top so you don't make carnage everywhere? So by watching that bubble, you can actually see the viscosity of the of the honey and how thick it is. Um, so that's a true indicator of, of thick honey. When you do that with imported honey or honey that's been adulterated with corn syrup, that bubble will move at a different rate. You want to see something cool? Yeah, don't juggle my honey. You crazy clown. Oh! <laughs> okay. Okay, so honey demonstration, Mr. Juggler. Today I brought you some honey frames to extract. So you're going to teach uh, Alicia how to extract? We're going to extract. Yeah. Alicia and I are going to... So some of the gear that's used, this one here is an heated knife so if we plug this in it'd be nice and warm and you can actually cut through the cappings with it and get a clean finish mm -hmm. however if you aren't that sophisticated or don't want to spend the money you can just use a standard kitchen knife if you heat it up in warm water and then dry it off it'll cut through the wax just just as easily so we got we gotta we gotta get something to remove the cappings right off the honey so that's step number one Step number two is to have some honey. To have some honey, yeah. Okay, so honey and honey. This side is beautiful, it's fully capped. This side still has uh, some capping to do. To check it, you can shake it. If it was only nectar, that would come out with a shake. Uh, we can also check the moisture content with uh, some other technology as well. Usually if I'm uncapping, I like to, at the spring, I like to try and get anywhere about 90% fully capped. Uh, and when I say that, with my gear I run 20 frames in an extractor and I'll run a couple extractors at a time. Uh, that will all homogenize and blend in together. Grab that one, Alicia. Wow, it's heavy. And here's a, here's a second one for you. So I, I try to bring two frames that were drawn out and capped about the same and that way our extractor will stay evenly balanced. Okay, guys. That's a nice one, Tim. That one's the wax is built out a little bit further. Yeah. So with these frames, these are these are the standard Hoffman frames. So when you have ten frames in a ten frame box, they come out to about flush with the edge. You can actually run a nine frame spacer and just put nine frames in a ten frame spot, and they'll with B space they'll actually draw that wax out further. It's really nice once you've got drawn gear from the from the previous season because then you're you're spacing, you don't get burr wax, and they do it properly. Now why um, does why does sometimes the wax looks light and sometimes the wax looks dark on the honey? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, so that's that's whether or not there's an air pocket underneath it. So sometimes they'll have a small air pocket, so they actually call that uh, wet, wet wet capping, cappings, where it's yes. where it's dark like that. And this one, these cappings here are actually slightly elevated off the cell, so you have a very small air pocket underneath there. So the but both is good. There's no difference in no, the quality of honey. No, there's no, no the difference honey. in the quality of honey. It's just what they do in the, in the hive. So you can see this one here is, is mainly wet over the top, and then the, the, it's slightly raised over this side here. Mm. Awesome. So, uncapping. You've never done it before? Never have. Okay. We'll grab a bucket. 
Yeah, and this is the time of year to, to take honey. It's definitely, you'll, when you go into your hives, you'll notice that uh, some of the frames are definitely capped right now. So if you leave the honey on too long, the bees will actually start to use it if they need it and uh, take, it, take it down into their hives. So it's definitely a good time to extract. Yeah, so usually if it's capped, you're fairly safe. If it's uncapped, like some of this down the bottom, they'll, they'll move that around the hive. Will they be upset if you take it? Like, do they need that for later? They, they do, but they still have plenty of time. We actually get uh, a second flow um, later in, in September, which can stock up the hives. And then if you're running commercial, the value of the honey is $7 to $10 a pound, depending on how you sell it. And you can substitute that with supplement feed like sugar syrup, like mm -hmm. fructose sugar syrup. Hey hmm. okay, guys, what we also have is a, a double screen. Um, so this is to strain the honey when it's going through. So you can either extract straight into a bucket and then uh, warm it up again slightly and, and screen it later on, or depending on your volume, you can do it straight away. We're gonna do it straight away uh, just as a demonstration today. And then we have our standard food grade bucket we just don't have a bottle of water, right? That's the no. thing we're lacking, yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's okay. There you go. So it has nothing to do with muscle, <laughs> thankfully. No. no. So <laughs> the wax, it's a warm day, so the wax will actually come off pretty easy. I'm just pressing in with my forefinger a little bit just to get through. You can tell he's done that before. Just trying to take the very top coating of the wax off. Don't go too deep. So the other tool you can use is a, a pricking fork or your kitchen fork out of your, out of your kitchen drawer and you just want to make sure every little cell is open. That looks great. Looks messy. It can be. It's a sticky product, but it's a tasty product. You can lick your fingers when no one's looking no, I don't know. I didn't or you can put your hands in warm water and it will just dissolve off your fingers. So nice and gentle. So the bigger machines, there's a, I have a, a chain uncapper that spins around and take these, takes the cappings off, or you can use a, a heated steam knife that's pretty much like the electric knife, it's just using a water element to go through. Okay, Alicia, I did So you that. definitely don't need fancy equipment to extract honey, like, like uh, Tim said, a kitchen knife and uh, will work just fine if you're only doing five or ten frames. Beautiful, dripping, warm, nice and clear. Uh, we actually do have two cells here that we're just gonna take out. So I don't run queen excluders this time of year, so there's one bee that hasn't hatched. We'll take that one out. So you wanna, wanna check your frames. You wanna make sure you don't have any, any, any disease in your frames. You don't wanna have any funky smells. Uh, you're looking for mice, you're looking for ants, uh, any remains of bees. I've done that one. You're up next. Oh boy. Looks like you're playing violin there. <laughs> if only I knew how to play violin. I have a feeling like if you knew how to play violin, it would help you with your uh, uncapping, maybe. Beautiful. Honey. Look at the look at no waste there. Look at all the honey on Tim's extra on uncapping there. No waste. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. And that's without a hot knife and without hot water. It's awesome. You would usually not do this outside because uh, <laughs> you're, you're only going to attract some bees. So we're going to usually choose to do this inside somewhere. But since we're with you today, we figured we'd do a couple frames before the bees found out what we were doing. But the camera crew's protected though, so that's what's important. Yeah, we, we, the camera crew's <laughs> sitting in a tent today, which is awfully smart. It, it took me about four shows to break it out for you guys, but you know. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that looks like good stuff, doesn't it? It's liquid gold right there. That's delicious. Can you eat these inner parts? You can. You can eat the wax. So when we're doing comb honey, people, all you have to do is uh, put it through a freeze cycle so you can get rid of any wax moth larvae or anything like that, uh, which is a standard process commercially for processing. But with what we're doing today, just uh, liquid extraction, you don't need to do that. That's probably good enough. Good enough? Yeah, I think that's good enough. Flip it over and get the other side done. We've got a bee here currently joining me. 
No, you, you yeah, can. you could. You oh. could. Yeah. Because I have. No, no. There's, there's no nutritional value to wax. So. Like chewing gum. Yeah, so if you want to do like a Jenny Craig's diet, it's one of those cheap things. You can you can eat it straight. You can pound a wax a day and zero calories. Yeah, huh? there's, there's no calories in it whatsoever. So um, I've actually had my honey lab tested uh, for export from New Zealand. And with that, uh, with our comb honey, they'll give you a full sugar breakdown, proteins right the way through. There's, there's no value in wax whatsoever from a nutritional perspective. But it's great for your skin. It is. So we actually make a lip balm, a body balm. Um, We've got ointments with uh, bee venom for apitherapy. It's always a fun time of year to extract, you know, at least the first couple frames, you know, it's right. exciting. It's mm. like pull, pulling just, your... Just a trick. Try to get your knife right over the far side uh -huh. and, and go down like you're carving a turkey. I don't know if you eat turkey, but... No turkey. <laughs> okay. This is me telling an American how to carve. Yeah. There you go. Beautiful. So all that slurry that you see at the bottom there, that can all be spun through a wax spinner later on. Sorry. Yes, I'm, and, I'm just too into that, it. And you can get more honey back out of your, out of your wax cappings. Uh, you can also put it through a worm drive press or an apple cider press if you've got one of those. Excellent. I feel like I'm not doing so great on this side. That's okay. So there's there's no real wrong. Well, your way knife of is stickier too. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like there's no real okay. way of, of doing it wrong, because it it can all be processed. Some people crush and strain it, so you know. Yeah. Okay. Crush me, and strain. Let me just tidy it up for you. Yeah, yeah. please so do. When you when you're running bigger gear, you want to make sure you get it all uncapped, even if you just break the cappings just by pushing your knife sideways. That way, your extractors will stay nice and balanced. Uh, and extracting. Is there better or worse? I mean, spinning is obviously like the... Yeah, so to answer that question, Chris, the only, the only advantage of using an extractor is you don't destroy your comb as much, which means for the following season, you, you, uh, the bees don't have to use energy or resources to draw out that wax. So that's where extraction comes in handy. In saying that, I produce a lot of comb honey, which then requires a lot of energy by the bees each year to produce more comb. Um, but crushing with a fork straight off the frame, that's, that's a real simple, easy process. So this is the uh, club's two frame extractor. So I guess it could do, uh, it could do four mediums or two deeps. Can, so, we, can we go to over top camera? Can you guys see that? In there, it's got a basket that sort of spins, and uh, it's a tangential extractor. So it's only gonna it's only gonna extract one side of the frame at a time. So it's like a cent big centrifuge basically. So it's gonna force out the the side of the the honey that's on the side of the frame that's closest to the outside wall of the extractor. So George, you notice that I've got plastic frames there. Uh, plastic frames can be uh, extracted either direction, either radial towards the center or tangential on the side, mm -hmm. and they, they don't fall apart. Correct, yes. If you're using a uh, straight foundation, wax foundation, you have to be very careful when you're extracting tangential because the weight of the honey on the inside will actually try and push and bow the, the foundation out. You're over there, Alicia. Okay, <laughs> oh have boy. a good look. Okay, so. I, I need this? Uh, uh, it may not be a bad idea. Yeah. So this is a, a manual hand crank. This takes a little bit of effort. Alicia's got big muscles from painting up ladders all day. <laughs> and she's probably, uh, well, I know she's fitter than I am and definitely fitter than George. So we're, we're good to go. So that's actually called washboarding. Guys, did you, can you pick that up on camera, Donna? Yeah, so you can actually see the bees moving backwards and forwards. They, they actually don't, they've given it a name, but they actually don't know the reason behind it. So actually, I believe uh, Penn State and University of Delaware are both studying it at the moment, trying to work out what's going on. Uh, after extraction, we'll actually come back to the hive and we can, I've actually got an infrared camera here today, so we can have a play around with that and, and check out the imagery too. Yeah, I have noticed they don't do it as much on the wax dip boxes, so I'm not sure what that means, but... Uh... They like paint. They like paint. They're doing, they do it much more on paint than they on like wax. Paint. Yeah. Yeah.
So we, we might be able to see a temperature difference too between paint and the wax dip on the camera. That could be a, another scenario. Yeah. There's probably a reason why they're not doing on the wax dip box. I just don't know what it is, you know. Well, I imagine there's more heat coming up because the boards, are, the uh, entrances are staggered back with sure. the units going up. So when we bring, when we turn the camera on, we can we can have a look. Okay, Alicia, back to Crank extracting. Do you know what you're doing? Nope. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. Do you turn left? Or do you turn right, George? Does it yeah, matter? Yeah, I don't know if it which, clock, which, clockwise. I think. So you just want to get that in there. Go ahead. So the reason why I asked that question, guys, is because the wax on the frame is actually there's a four degree angle. You got it real, real fast. You really go for it? Yeah, really, really go, go for, for it. it. The faster you go, the, the bigger the mess. It's a little tricky because you got to keep the, that the little metal thing in do there. You, do you keep going? Like yeah, that? you go for like 15 minutes usually. <laughs> 15 minutes? Yeah, that's why we started at the beginning. That's why of the we show. chose you. Where, where, where do I hold? Right, I'll hold. You hold. Just up top. Right in front of this hive. Yeah. There you go. Nice so guys, steady you piece. You can buy a manual extract for about $300. I think the electric upgrade's worth about $150 in, in the ballpark range, depending on your extractor. Um, that's a nice investment, getting that electrical upgrade. Yeah, you on the Mac, I'm not sure what brand this is, but I know on the Maxton range, yes, you can. They've got a universal size drum unit that fits a, a standardized motor. You got it. You want to open that honey gate at the front? Should I? Yeah, let's see what comes out. Uh oh. Keep going, keep cranking. You got a little stuck there. You're good. When you're ready. Nothing coming out yet, but you may have to tilt it forward on this hive, on this extractor. Yeah, maybe. We have to fill it up until it comes out. Yeah, you have to fill it up until it comes out. The, the uh, gate sits up a little high. So I usually say two or three minutes, you know, and then you flip them, I think. Yeah, so I have uh, flanges bolted on my honey gates that go straight into tanks um, with clear reinforced pipe, food grade piping so I can see the honey coming out and check it. Has anyone got any questions online about extracting honey? We can do that while Alicia's doing annual labor for me today. <laughs> Nothing yet. This is really why you guys had me come here <laughs> for manual labor. <laughs> Let's, uh, I can start to smell it. That's a good sign. This is not where you want to stand. I, I know people have been saying, George, why are, you, why are you standing in front of the hives on all these shows? I said, no really reason, just because I, you got the short straw at the beginning of the show, mate. So, yeah, this is not a good place to stand, but these are nice bees in this hive. We established that, so. I think we flip them. What do you think? Donna, you got a question? Yeah, is there like an average pound per frame? Like I'm pointing this about between two and two and a half for medium frame, is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Depends on if you're running nine frame uh, spacing tools. I, yeah, so you'll, you'll, you'll get about that. Um, if they're all drawn out and capped. Ooh, that's good. So a good, good rule of thumb is about 25 pounds a, a super. Well, I'm working up a sweat, yeah. It is good exercise. Good so. thing it was overcast today, because otherwise I would It's a great thing to do with your kids. You know, you get your kids and say, hey, you yeah, know, we got some labor. fun today. Yeah, yeah child. <laughs> unpaid child labor. I'm not sure if spinning the extractor would qualify <laughs> as unpaid child labor. <laughs> okay, you child labor laws. Can we, uh, can we pull up a frame and we gotta look flip at them. it? Because we got we to gotta rotate them over. Do it all over again, huh? Do it all yeah, over so again. Let's have a look and see what we got. What one side looks like now on the other side, George. So you can see the difference. This is the unspun side. The unspun side here, nice and still has a lot of uh, honey on it. And then the spun side here, which basically is all empty. So fantastic. We're gonna, Good job, Alicia. Nice Sorry. arm strength. So we're just going to flip it to the other side. So you'll do the same thing, Alicia, on the other side. Just yeah. flip the frame for me. Who, who needs the gym? So, guys, if you're harvesting honey out of your deeps um tangential is the so way like to go a, on most of the extractor yeah, range in the, in the like, hobbyist market no no, the, no it just sits in there if they get too close to the center so, you'll find you don't extract the honey in the, in the bottom of the edge of the frame so it'd be a very long day for me to do this alicia 
So I'm trying to put out uh, 20 frames every 15 minutes with my extractors. With that, I am uncapping continuously uh, with MaxLink gear. We can actually show that next time as a video clip. Um, however, the concept's all the same, right? Just spin the honey out. My mum in New Zealand, she actually crushes the honey off the frames because uh, Manuka honey, for example, is, is a thick tropic honey, so it's very thick. So you actually have to prick each cell to release the suction uh, surface tension of the cell to get it out. So to build an extraction plant down there is about $150,000 to $400,000, depending on your size. Whoa. No, so I have a, a Maxon chain. Sound like you're taking off there for a second. I, have I a like Maxon it. Chain <laughs> that, has, that has two drums of stainless steel uh, <laughs> chain that comes out. You gotta make sure you, you take all this home. Don't let the tape frame. video behind you today. It goes up and down like a <laughs> really pipe open toaster. It. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sir. You're good. I'll kick you later. <laughs> We're having a side conversation here. Okay. Oh, yeah. We got anything dripping out the front? Nothing, but we're gonna. I, I think it's a matter of tilting forward, turning it. Turn. I, I would give it 30 more seconds, real fast, just to polish it off, and then we'll we'll tip it forward and drain it onto the onto the strainer. There you go. That's good enough. Well done. It's a little wonky, even though we did balanced frames. Well okay, done, now Alicia. we're gonna tilt it forward. That's as you can thing. see. That's hard work. So. As you're thinking about buying extractors or renting extractors, think about the, the volume of honey that you have and get the right tools for the job. It's pretty much beekeeping 101. This is a little... Uh... And it is an investment that lasts for a long time. So if you're going to grow your apiary yard, don't buy for the here and now. Buy for your future yeah. use. Yeah, so it sounds like you either need equipment or like really powerful triceps. Yes. Yeah. Or a yeah. party. Or party? Party. Yeah. You know, I think it's great. You know, you get like five or ten of your friends over, you all have them spin it for a while and take home a bottle of honey. I don't even know if I have that many friends. Sure you do. <laughs> I'll put an ad on Craigslist. Yeah. You know, looking for people to party. That That is beautiful. See how light that's coming out and how it, the honey's folding on itself? That just shows you the, the moisture content right at the moment. It's really quite dry. Is that a good thing? That be dry. is a really good thing. So honey, when it has too high a moisture content, I believe it's 18.4, can actually start fermenting. Really? Yeah, so you can actually, you can check your honey and you can blend your batches together to keep it, keep it nice and nice and light and dry. Still coming out? Still is, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my honey, mate. Get as much out of it as possible. No, this is Alicia's honey. <laughs> We've already established that. <laughs> <laughs> We've got an empty container over here we can pour it in for you. You can take it home, Alicia. That'd be great. Just don't tell Don, my business partner. He might not be watching. <laughs> well, it's on the internet now. Look at that thing. There's a, there's a high beetle larvae crawling on that uh, on the bottom board there. You see it? Oh, wow. Oh, I just left. Yeah, it was a small high beetle larvae. So they actually pupate in the soil out yeah. in front of the hive. So that was on its way out. That was on soil. its way out. That was kind of interesting. Still coming or are we done? That's a little bit. You give it a shake. You're shaking it from the crotch, mate. That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> You're getting some in the bucket. You're missing the bucket. You're miss, missing the... Uh, yeah, there you go. I think I'm done. <laughs> you can do. Um, yeah, guys, so the, the, the hive beetle that's crawling out the front there. So small hive beetles, they actually pupate in the soil out in front. You can spray in front of your hives. Um, I actually find the best thing to do is put a piece of plywood or something solid in front of your hives good. and then actively try and trap yeah, inside your hive. So you can use Swiffer sheets, you can use the beetle blaster traps, you can bait them with the oil. I know some guys use the cockroach um, combat, like which is, a, is a, a mitis or it's an insecticide. So oh, wow. there's, there's different things that you can do. We could do a teamwork there, but I think you got it, Alicia. Yeah, I think you're good. It looks really, look at that, beautiful. That's right, it's got a, it's on a lock. Am I still getting honey? A little bit. Yeah, can you 
center the nozzle, it looks like it's off to the side. Rotate your drum. Yeah, rotate the drum. Out of the way. Better? Other way. Other way. There you go. There you go. Nope, towards, you, towards me. Oh. No, no, we'll the drum, move the whole thing that way. Guys, as you can see, it can get, it can get messy right. really quickly. So one of the things you can do is if <laughs> no you're in the exactly. kitchen, if you're in the kitchen doing it at home, put a tarpaulin down, right at the top, for you guys that don't use full English. So <laughs> you can put down a sheet of plastic. You really, it's going to be a real sticky mess when if things go wrong, things get knocked over. So looks good. Your garage is a nice place to do yeah. it. Make sure the deal, doors are sealed when you're doing it. You can put a, a, some duct tape around or masking tape. And then, you, and then you're good to go. You gonna have a look? No, I'm just waiting for it to strain. Tim, before you leave this subject, can you talk about washing that out and how you process it and get it ready for the next? Okay, so there's two methods. One is you just leave the covers open and let the bees wash it out, and then you just rinse it again with uh, water and Clorox afterwards, and then make sure it's really dry. So legally, um, the international export, you only need to wash your gear once a year. So Honey is acidic, it's about 5.5 on the pH scale, um, and the high sugar content makes it antibacterial. So as long as the moisture content is below the golden threshold of 18%, it's A-grade honey, and therefore nothing's gonna grow in it, and it's a, it's a sterile product. So we actually don't wash our, our processing plant um, through the season, because as our honeys go from the very light to dark, there's no contrast in color, and you just blend it right the way through. So with our system, we have uh, pumps and um, strainers, like there's quite a bit of gear in that processing line. So you, you don't really want to introduce water if you can help it. Going back to this scale, you simply leave it outside for, for two days on its side. The bees can drown in the, in the honey, so you want to make sure it's fairly dry but they will walk up and down the inside of the cavity wall and they will clean it with their proboscis. So they'll basically suck it dry. It's the same concept that we use for um, hive cutouts where we'll cut the bees out of the void, remove them, and there'll be a small cluster left. You come back in about 10 days and it's completely dry, like they've, they've, they've basically consumed it again. The bees will take this back down and take it back to their hives. Okay, it's really, really simple. Like beekeeping's a whole lot of basic uh, beekeeping 101 science in a row. Nice heads up, mate. I'll move you out of the way. <laughs> Where are you going with that, honey? Don't I'm go gonna, too far. I'm going to take it over here for Alicia later. On. So for someone like me that only has one or two hives, what yes. would be... The, the, the easiest, the cheapest version for you is actually just crushing it off the frame and putting it through a colander or a sieve in your house, in your kitchen. When you say crush, you mean I mean just physically scrape it off the frame, back to the bare bones of the plastic or plastic frames. You got plastic or foundation, like the wax uh, foundation? Wax foundation. So be more gentle with the plastic frames. You can just, with your hive tool, you can just scrape it right off into the bucket. Right. Okay. So with mine, just scrape it down. Do you have to then re-wax them? No. Just be gentle. Just be gentle. Don't punch through the center, center column. You've got probably wire reinforced. Yeah. Yeah, so just, just be gentle with a, a blunt object. So your hive tool or a spoon. Right. And you can just scrape right the way through. Scrape right the way through. Yeah. To give you, give you a demonstration with plastic. Guys, plastic is almost bulletproof. I'll just do the edge. You can actually just go through when you're taking it off and it just comes straight off like that. You put it into your, into your sieve or your colander and, and you're good to go. If you just smear that on the back on the frame, the bees will rework that and take that to where they need to go. Then they need to build up the comb again. And I need it a little bit. And it's not my hive. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they will. But they'll build it out again. So if you've got a wax surface that's already there because you've pre-waxed your frames, um, these may have came in uh, double wax coated. I like to roll her on, even on top of that later on in the, in the spring. Um, they'll, they'll rebuild it back out. How physically can you like do that? The, that wax layer in the, in the center of those uh, frames seems so like easy to perforate. Yeah, so be gentle. Just how easy? It depends on these. Ah, right. So I don't know my own strength. Yeah, so like if you got a surgeon standing next to you, he might be a bit more delicate than like a panel beater, for mm -hmm. example, or like a finesse paint, uh, painter like yourself that does real delicate work, mm -hmm. you'll have no problems. Watching you the way you're cutting the wax off compared to how 
rough I was, right? You'll learn it with repetition. It's a, it's a balance that everyone needs to find for themselves. Mm. If you go plastic, which is more of a commercial operation, the bees don't accept it as much, so you gotta doctor up the frames right. a little bit more in the season, but they're pretty much bulletproof, mm -hmm. right? So you can you can be pretty rough with them. Would you recommend switching to plastic, or does I, it matter? I, I would phase it into your program, just from my personal preference, because I'm running like, thousands of these frames, mm. right? And they're, they're easy to use. Like, I like the white because um, it's a, a nice clean color. Mm -hmm. So if you put your frame, if they say people put their frames down on the ground, you can see if you've got any dirt contamination, whereas the black frames are a little bit harder to see on color choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and this hive did not, this hive went all season without a queen excluder on it. So and you can see that the, the top medium in this hive is completely filled with honey. So again, you don't, you don't necessarily need to run queen excluders to, to get honey. You know, they're gonna generally put honey up, up top. You may not get as much, and you may have to be a little bit more selective of what frames you take, but you could definitely, you know, get honey without running yeah. a queen excluder. What happens if you do have some honey and some brood, or does that never happen? You, you actually, this time of year, in our operation, we're actually putting, starting to put queen excluders on. So mm -hmm. usually our spring honey, as with George's frame in his hand there, we're usually only taking fully capped frames that have no contamination in them. So, so no we'll brood. actually go through each box and pull out those frames. Uh, boxes that have brood, We'll then add a queen excluder on now and let that brood hatch out. Mm. So then you can come back and depending on the cycle that brood stage, anywhere up to a month later, mm -hmm. you can start harvesting. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to put brood in your you know it, it, yeah if your if your frame had brood on it or larvae on it, you definitely right. don't want to be putting that in your extractor. Right. Yeah. But uh, I'm just saying this is just an example of how you can get you know, a decent yeah. amount of honey without without running a queen excluder. The other thing some people do is run the queen excluder. Uh, the other way so they allow the bees to move quickly up and down the ends of the boxes and usually the queen will stay in that sphere usually towards the center of the hive so she'll hit that queen excluder and go back down um, but ideally you'd be wanting to rotate those frames anyway to give space above the queen for laying even if she can't get there it tricks her into not producing swarm cells mm. so there, there's a few little fine things to do but you definitely don't need queen excluders when you know how to identify your queen in the hive and two, when you've got more time and patience to go through when you're selecting to pull for your honey extraction. You know, and th this was a hive, as, as those of you who followed along with us this year know that this hive was never a big hive. You know, this hive was always kind of population wise on the, I would say on the smaller side, but you know, at, at, at here we are the middle of June and, and that deep is completely filled of honey. So that's, like we said, that's about 25 or 30 pounds that, of that, honey. That medium. And that, that medium, yeah. yeah. And there'll, there'll be honey in the deep below too. So if you, if you, want to you can go through if, if you can identify your queen you can you can pull further down and by extracting your deeps you actually allow more space so you don't get honey bound mm. which allows the queen as we go into dearth usually they start back they don't produce as much wax so they start backfilling mm -hmm. so it allows you to build a larger population going into the fall which will actually give you a, a more successful overwintering rate sure yeah along, and, along with uh testing for varroa and treating of course and the average hive the average hive in chester county makes about probably between 35 and 40 pounds of honey a year so uh you know we're in a really good area to produce honey for sure and uh you know if you're just if you if you're just making honey for for yourself for your friends and your family if you're running two or three hives you could definitely you could definitely pull 50 to 70 pounds of honey off a year and be happy with it okay. and and really not and not you know, the question is, is how do you know how much is too much, right? You asked that, Alicia, like, obviously, oh, there's Mr. Joan landed on my arm. You know, you, you, you know that, that becomes a, that becomes a issue, you know, as far as, uh, you know, not, not to feel like you're taking all the honey away from the bees, you know, and uh, I, I guess they say, a, they say a, a hive needs about 60 pounds of honey to about that. To, to overwinter. So you can sort of get a sense of what's left in the bottom by just lifting up lifting the hive up. and seeing if it feels like 60 or 70 pounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Will you they know. ever produce uh, honey at the bottom or is that usually? Yeah, so there's honey all, there, there'll be honey all the way through this hive. You know, they'll, they'll set up the honey like, like a dome basically. Yeah. So on the sides, like on frame one and two and one and two and one and two, there'll probably be honey in it. Yeah. So there'll definitely be honey on the sides of these boxes. Yeah. So when you, when you think about Alicia, that even though it's a square box, the, the brew chamber is basically a sphere inside yeah. the hive. So with the 
eggs, the larvae and the pupae, on the outside edge of that you're going to have a ring of protein which is the pollen and then you have your carbohydrates. So they mix the protein and the carbohydrate together to make bee bread which is what they feed all the young bees. And then the reason why they keep the pollen closer is because they need that for raw jelly production which they feed all the, every larvae gets that for the first couple of days. Before we break in any further, George, can we just uh, switch over to our observation hive viewing? Give you a little bit more time to look at get Sure, ready. absolutely. I'm just messing now, so. Yeah. All right, Chris, if you want to roll that tape that for us, guys, we're think. just going to show you my observation. This is Tim Ferriss from local Test school. Canada Beekeepers. Uh, something that the, uh, the, thank the, you for the pub put together. Working with uh, us the school was able to get it on a grant. Um, it's something pretty, pretty cool. School. I think it'll be a great learning And then we'll come back to the hive. Just to let you know what we're going to do today. Um, there are bees in this top box, and it contains five of these wooden frames that this is what beekeepers put in their hive. Some of the frames are plastic, some are wooden, and then this sheet in the middle is called foundation that's either plastic, like this one that is wax coated to help the bees get started, or sometimes it's wax foundation. The frames, when they're in the hive, will rest right up against each other and that allows the bees whose wax glands have been activated will start building the wax out on either side of that foundation just to the width of the frames so that when the frames are side by side like that in the hive, which they will be, they leave just enough space for bees to go through their single file, what we call bee space, which is about three eighths of an inch. So the frames in those boxes already have the wax drawn out, uh, some of them on both sides completely. There's at least one frame in there that the wax is partially drawn out on. Um, so you will get to see, once the hive is installed, the bees building the wax out, as well as you'll see um, the adult worker bees and drones brood, which consists of eggs, larvae, and then once the larvae is fully developed, it starts to pupate. Yeah, tapping across the top of, the, of those cells so that the pupa can spin a cocoon and pupate and then emerge as an adult bee later. Um, there will also be some cells that are filled with pollen and honey, which is what they make from the nectar. That's their sole source of food. The nectar from the flowers is their source of carbohydrates. The pollen is their source of protein. Other than nectar and pollen, water is their only other food. Great. Hey guys, welcome back to Live Feed. Uh, we just zoomed in, we've actually got an infrared camera going. So I use infrared for hive cutouts out of buildings to try and find the colonies. If you look in closely, you can see the extra heat of yellow of the bees. So if you're in a, if you're inside a, an inside a house, you'll actually get that same well, yellow color coming here. through. So in Celsius, it's reading 32, see, 33 degrees, the bottom of these cells, uh, which is basically body eggs. temperature of 36 degrees Celsius is the around 98 dots. Fahrenheit. So as you can see with the, uh, the split back with the two dark, hives, dark you can see, see that heat coming up and you can see that okay. heat at the entrance. So going back to that washboarding that we were talking about earlier, yeah. because the, the, this. the brew chambers are staggered, there's no, more problem. heat going directly up, so we had more ventilation, more washboarding going on in that space. So the bees can actually uh, change their body position and start fanning, and that will create a, a draft going up through the hive for ventilation. Hey right, guys, going back to the hive, you're looking through the, the deeps at the moment, through the brew chamber, this hive had swarmed. So ideally we're looking for uh, brood, make sure we got a queen, either eggs or larvae is a good sign. And then we're also also discussing how much honey is further down the hive. Is that a bee? <laughs> so what do you see guys? Well, we see a lot of honey in this hive. Now that's not really unexpected because the, uh, the hive swarmed and, and there was no larvae to, to, to take care of or no brood to take care of. So basically everything they were foraging went into honey for a couple of weeks. On the frame that uh, Alicia is holding, I think I see some eggs, uh, singular. Well, you know. well I, I'm pretty sure. You want to take a look, Tim? You know, the question is, is it, 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 are, they, are they eggs from a queen or are they eggs from a, a laying worker? Okay. You know, and I don't know early on how to tell the difference, you know? 
they're not really that. Sorry, my, it, my concern is that they're not really that. Uh, well, so I'll let you say. So when, when George is saying that, you're looking for a pattern. So if we look at the frame, the eggs are quite staggered, which a new land queen can do because she'll walk a lot more than a, and than a more seasoned queen. Um, but the eggs are in the center of the cells and there's only one per cell, which is a good indicator that it's not a land worker. A land worker's abdomen isn't as long, so usually she will put eggs on the cell walls rather than right at the bottom of the cell. A, a new, newly uh, mated queen can lay multiple eggs too. So I usually try and, in a situation like this, is actually go through and find the queen. Or I'll come back in three or four days time and see if that pattern improves. Yeah, the only thing I don't like about what's on that frame is the, is the really spottiness of the pattern. You know, and, and uh, you know, I'm not 100% confident that the hive has effectively requeened itself at this point. Because I've seen laying workers start kind of like with that ish pattern yeah they, they can start that way so ideally finding the queen i also if i've got a, a bad pattern uh from the original queen i usually not to try and let that hive requeen itself i'll actually requeen <laughs> it with different stock only from the perspective that you've got that same trait same genetic line going through yeah so maybe what we're seeing is the what the mother was doing right yeah it could be a flow on effect because it, it's it's usually a trait that follows the female line but this, these bees continue to be very nice though they are very gentle. I'm not yeah. wearing any gear. If, was, if these were my hives that are more commercially, mm -hmm. uh, not aggressive, but more commercially uh, forage orientated, like averaging 80 pounds a hive rather than, rather than 40, um, they would be buzzing everywhere and trying to lick the, the moisture off my <laughs> eyeballs right about now. But a very average pattern. Um, the other thing to do is watch it hatch into larvae and that will tell you if you've got any, any brood disease. So with that, you can see them start doing hygienic behavior and that's when your pattern can also change. So eggs is one thing from a, from a laying pattern from what the queen will do. And the other aspect is the larvae pattern and how much hygienic behavior the bees are doing and how many uh, bad, bad larvae that they're pulling out basically, whether it's got disease or whether they're just not happy. Oh, that one's it. all honey. Yeah. Okay, so that's all part of hygienic behavior. You can go to the oh, other extreme perfect. where you can have that's, extremely wet hygienic cap, stock, so that's and they'll actually remove about, like wet cat versus a, a dry lot cap. of the brood out of the hive, to, and it will actually collapse itself. So Alicia was asking about the darker color of the cappings, and that's what we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, so earlier we we're talking about how that's that's wet honey. So if you scrape it, see how it's right on the surface. It, you can see now, but just by pressing it, you can actually see uh, the honey is now touching the wax. So that's what's called wet honey compared to dry honey. So most of that is uh, is pretty wet. Would you leave that in there longer to dry, or? No, it's not. It's not moisture content, right? So that's mm. it's a bad terminology. Okay, mm -hmm. the name of the phase. So all it is is basically whether the honey is drawn all the way out to the where right, they've right, kept right. the wax or not. So there's there's no real difference in the greater honey. They haven't worked out whether it will keep longer or anything mm. like that, as far as I'm aware. So this is a hive that definitely w warrants another look at in, in a couple days, you know, because if, if we can't find the queen or if the laying pattern doesn't get better, we surely would like to try to solve this situation before it gets much worse if it is a laying worker developing. Chris, we've got time for Q&A as we're approaching uh, later into the, into the time period. Um, one thing to look at, guys, when before Q&A is the, the honey super on the ground. If you zoom in for us, Donna, you notice it's not directly on the ground, right? So aren't that nice. what you can do is, is put mm. your outer cover oh. down flat, now you're on flat to get surface a little, and you know, stack your gear that way. When I push that frame if down. If you're transporting your honey supers back to little, your kitchen or, or wherever you're going, you want to little, cover uh, it once the bees are out. So. There are a couple of methods of getting the bees out. One, you can use an, es an escape board, which I'll go and get to show you. And the other is you, you, can, you can actually blow them out with a, uh, with a leaf blower. These bees are starting to hum a little bit, Tim, so I'm just gonna... You good? I'm just gonna put them back together. Can you pick up that hum on the mic? Can you hear it? You can hear they starting to increase their hum a little bit, so... You hear it now? <laughs> I know you can hear it. 
Yeah, when you start to hear that sound, it's time to say, okay, I'm done. My hive does that all almost the time. all the time. No, we've already established that these bees are really, you know, these are, these are nice bees for the backyard beekeeper because they're, they're, they're uh, generally gentle. Just before you put the lid on, George. Sure. Guys, this is a, a Liga escape board uh, panel. I actually got these ones in from Jiner and made them direct, so I have a few hundred of them. How you do it is you actually put that on top of your uh, brew chamber, you put your honey super on top, you leave it on for two to three days. The bees can smell the other bees below them, and then they walk out these exit points. The way it's designed is it's like a funnel system, so they come through. It takes them about four or five days to learn how to go back the other way. So that will depopulate your honey supers. Uh, then you can lift them up on the edge and then blow out the remainder of bees. When I say remainder of bees, you might have 10 to 20 bees in that box when it's done properly. Um, it's a lot gentler on your hives. Your hives will stay nice and calm. And when you're doing it, you can also under super. So you could put your next box on, next honey super on, and then put this on top and then put your one that you're going to extract on top of that. That'll force the bees down and they'll start working on that next box below. So a nice, very cheap uh, piece of tool. You only use it for a few days of the year, but it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a really nice way to keep your hives nice and balanced. Okay, mate, close up. Hey, looks good. Nine minutes? We could wrap up early today if there's no questions too. Go get our, go get our lunch. <laughs> okay. We're gonna eat honey for lunch. That's, yeah, that's a good one. Did you bring a spoon? You were talking about bringing spoons. I, I forgot that, you know. But uh, so what are we? What are we gonna? What we're are we talking gonna... about food then? So why don't we roll the uh, the clip from juniper tree, and they can show you an idea for lunch. All right. Yeah. So guys, juniper tree. They're up in Eagle. They make uh, smoothies. They make uh, acai bowls. Um, it's a nice little uh, cafe type system. Uh, one of the many in throughout Chester County that's buying local honey and using it through their menu range. Hello, Amanda Wilkes here at Juniper Tree Juice and Coffee Bar in the village of Eagle in Chester Springs. Uh, we use local honey from Extract and Box for a lot of our menu items. We sweeten our smoothies, smoothie bowls, energy bites, and even our lattes. Come inside and see. All right, we're going to put together a nice acai bowl. Acai is a Brazilian berry from Brazil and full of antioxidants. But we use um, acai and frozen banana to make the base. Add a little bit of granola on the bottom. Um, and then, I think my even shared this, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's great seeing people uh, use our local honey. You know, it's definitely a, a commodity that we all should value. And, and uh, like I said, it's really not that hard to, to uh, enjoy and extract your own honey. So we really, really hope that you learned something today. Next, in, in two weeks, we'll be back. And I think two weeks, we're going to start our uh, Varroa discussion, you know, sort of about what is Varroa, uh, why, do, why do beekeepers care about Varroa, what are we doing about Varroa, what are the options to do about Varroa. So it's really a, an important thing to understand whether or not you're a beekeeper or not beekeeper of, 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 the, of uh, what beekeepers are trying to manage to keep our hives healthy. So, and what, then we're also, go ahead, Tim. What do you, what do you use, George? I use Formic uh, Mitoway Quick Strips, uh, and, and I try to get them in, in in late July or early August to start, is, is my usual first treatment. Okay, so I'm actually using uh, Formic Pro. I find the mortality rate is a, is a little bit less with them. Um, mm. The reason why I do that is currently queens are about $27 each. Like I know you're breeding your own, I breed mine as well, but when you need to replace 50 or 60 in True. one day, it's, 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 a, it's a bit more of a drama. Uh, the efficiency rate, efficacy rate is a, is a little bit uh, less with Formic Pro, but it also lasts two years. So if anyone's interested in Formic Pro, uh, they can reach out to me with the club. I'm doing a, a big bulk buy at the moment and splitting, splitting packs down, which probably saves you about 50% on Formic Pro in bulk. Um, so if anyone's got any questions on that, they can shoot me an email at tim at extractandbox.com. 
and it'll take care of you while we're at it. And what are, what are you doing this year, Alicia, for Varroa? I have no idea. She'll, she'll learn in two weeks' time, I guess. <laughs> right answer, right? Good answer. <laughs> yeah, so we can talk about uh, different treatment options next week, what you do with smaller nucleus colonies as well, compared to using acid, there's, there's different strip options. Um, and then we've got a, a hive cutout that we're going to show that we did earlier in the year. And we also have, what was the last thing, George? Artificial insemination. Artificial insemination. So I was lucky enough to spend time with Daryl Barkhouse, who's a, got a PhD. He also runs a local lab as a director of a lab. Uh, we had him at our facility on this, just this past Saturday um, doing artificial insemination with Queens, which is a new avenue that the club started uh, last year, and we're trying to perfect it this year. So we got some video footage on that that will be edited by then, and we'll be good to go. How do you feel about harvesting honey now? Uh, somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Yeah. yeah. Better than when you started, Be Yeah, better than when I started. I had no idea how to do that at all whatsoever. So, I learned something today. Cool. So, so the other option is say, hey, Tim, can you extract my honey for yeah. you? <laughs> and I'll be like, sure. How many frames do or how many boxes do you have? You're like, two. I'm like, sure, that's no problem at all. And I can uh, put that through my honey processing plant that will only take a couple of minutes and save your arm muscles absolutely and, and time so you can carry yeah. on painting and yeah that's and the working. benefit to joining your local <laughs> beekeepers association yeah. awesome thanks for joining us today hey guys we'll see you next time